Well, hi, everybody. This is Philip Shields, and uh, thank you for letting us uh, be invited into your home to speak. And today we're talking about what do you believe? If someone asked you in context of your spiritual and religious beliefs, um, and if they said, what do you believe in your church? And, and you personally, what are your primary beliefs? beliefs? What do you believe? How would you answer that? Those of you who pastor a congregation who listen, uh, why not ask your congregation if you want to give a similar, or if you want to play this message or give a similar one, just ask them that question. What do you believe? And then discuss it among them and see what they say. I'd love to hear what you discover. And um, many of us who belong and believe in keeping the seventh day Sabbath uh, would immediately probably jump to that. I mean, a lot of the denominations that keep seventh day Sabbath, there's quite a few. Um, as their primary, I, I, a lot of them who keep the Seventh-day Sabbath have that even as the name of their denomination, Church of God, Seventh-day, Seventh-day Adventist, and so on. And then others don't put it as part of their name, but that is a very, very important central belief. So if they or this any from these kinds of groups of people were asked, what do you believe, what are your primary beliefs, I believe many of the church members would immediately say something, because I've heard this over and over and over for many, many years, that these are essential, these are the main things that make us different, these are the main things that are important that I believe. So they would say, what do I believe? Oh, we don't keep Sunday. We keep the seventh day as the Sabbath from Friday sundown, in fact, to Saturday sundown. We rest, we pray, we attend Sabbath services on Saturday. In other words, to be clear, we keep seventh day Sabbath. Then we might continue. While we're at it, let me tell you about the seven annual annual Sabbaths, seven holy days, feast days of God, uh, which where we also rest and worship. And you know, you probably heard of some of these. We would be saying to them, the Passover, the Days of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, Feast of Trumpets or Blasts, Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Eighth Day. So we keep the weekly Sabbath, and we keep what's we call the annual high days, the annual Sabbaths. And let me see, what else do we keep We and don't keep? We don't keep Christmas, Easter, New Year's, or Halloween. They're all pagan. And that's why you don't see me at Christmas parties or you see our house with no Christmas decorations and Christmas trees. You, you, you won't see that in our home. And we certainly do keep God's food laws. We would never eat pork and crab and shrimp and shellfish or lobster. Not even pepperoni, as that's made of pork. And we're still talking to this person who has asked us, what are your main beliefs? Uh, and that's about it. We might try to start wrapping up. Oh, oh, wait, yes, we deeply believe in God's Holy Spirit in our church, but we do not believe in the Trinity, three persons in one. We don't believe the Holy Spirit is a separate third person of a Trinity. Nor do we believe in the secret rapture, especially the pre-trib rapture. We just don't believe in those things. Other than that, we read the Bible and go to church and try to be good people. That might be the way a lot of people would answer, what do you believe? There's nothing wrong with bringing those up eventually, uh, but what's wrong with bringing those up as the primary things we believe right off the bat, as soon as you're asked? And you know, 30 or 40 years ago, I may have answered that question, what do I believe in the same way? But I don't anymore, and I wouldn't anymore, and not at least for 25 or 30 years. Eventually, those other things come up, but those are not my most important central beliefs, or the first things I want to mention to people. And yes, I do keep Sabbath, I do keep the feast days, but it's not my first go-to comment, okay? Are you getting my point? What do you proclaim as your central belief? Well, I want to say what Paul says to the Romans in Acts, I mean Romans 10, Romans 10, verses 8 to 10. And what does it all say? I'm quoting Romans 10, verse, verses 8 to 10 right now. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness.
because we believe in a righteousness by faith. Not, not a righteousness by works, but a righteousness by faith. And faith, of course, will evidence itself in a, a life that is like the life of Christ more and more. And with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. So verse 10, Romans 8, 10, with the heart one believes to righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. So I would be saying to someone, if they say, Philip, what are your main beliefs? I know you have light on the rock. What are your main beliefs? I may have to even edit what we have up there and just double check and see what's up there. But I would say, I believe in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, as my, as my Savior. I believe that he came and lived a perfect life so he could take upon himself all the sins when and if we repent. So our own record of sin is wiped clean. I believe in him. I live in him. He is my life. He is my purpose. He's my whole being. And I believe that God raised him from the dead. God Almighty now sees us who have repented and received his spirit as his children without sin, without guilt, because Jesus has brought us back into close union with our Father, God Almighty, and has wiped away our sins with his blood. So I believe in the death and the resurrection of my Savior, Jesus Christ, and that he's now living in me and others who believe in him and confess him. I confess Jesus Christ as my Savior, as my God, and God the Father, as even Jesus is God. He's God Almighty. He's God Most High. God the Father is. So that's my starting point belief in God the Father, who had a son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died for us and continues to live for us. That's my starting point belief. Now, how about you? What would you say? So, if I'm asked why I can't do something on a Saturday, after I say that, or some other time, or go to a Christmas dinner, yeah, I'd probably uh, get right into that, not balking at all, but getting right into answering that. But even then, I'm sure that I want them to get the right impression. So I'll be clear, and I'll try to be a little more gentle than I might have been 30 years ago. For example, why aren't you coming to our Christmas dinner? I would preface my comments of my belief by saying, before I explain it, explain it, please understand. I do believe in the virgin birth of my Savior Jesus Christ, that he was born in Bethlehem in a manger, and all the Bible stories and accounts of his birth in two of the four Gospels. But... Having said that, so please understand, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in his birth. But I don't believe that he was born December 25. And that's easily confirmed with a Google check, various encyclopedias, even History Channel, um, the origins of Christmas, when was Christ really born. You'll find it yourself very easily. So because I believe keeping Christmas is keeping old pagan Saturnalia customs and traditions alive, we don't keep it. That's why I don't come to Saturday business meetings. That's why I don't come to Christmas dinners. In fact, Christ's birth story is not even mentioned in two of the four Gospels. I don't know if you knew that or not. So that's what I would say. So today, if asked what constitutes my religious belief, the bullet-pointed list above that I started with in my notes when I said that we keep, sun, we, we keep Saturday, not Sunday, we keep annual holy days, not holidays, we don't keep Christmas and Easter, we don't eat pork and all that kind of stuff, I would not start with that. So in the early church, in the early Christians, when the deacon Philip went to Samaria, what does it say he preached? Now there had been a great persecution. The, one of the deacons, Stephen, had been killed, stoned and killed. And then the persecution continued. There were more who died, according to Paul's account of things in Acts 26. But let's pick up the story in Acts 8, verses 4 and 5, and then verse 12. Acts 8. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And Philip, this was one of the deacons who was ordained, went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. That's what it says. 
Verse 12, And when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. There's nothing mentioned there about children being baptized. I'm sure there were lots of children. Men and women were baptized. Because when you're baptized, you are, when you're baptized, you are basically indicating that you want to be the bride of Christ and you want to follow him and obey him and, and, and you have repented of sins. I think those are very mature things that have to happen. But anyway, I'm getting off, off the point here. But he preached concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, you can't have a kingdom of God without Christ. He's the king of that kingdom. He's the door into that kingdom. He's the judge of that kingdom. And he's the life of that kingdom. But you'll find over and over, if you look up in the concordance, preached Christ or preach Christ, uh, you'll see that over and over that's what they preached as their primary message, their first message foray into talking about spiritual things. So Philip later on is told to go run to this chariot that he saw on the way to Gaza. And there was the Ethiopian eunuch there reading from the book of Isaiah. It looks like Isaiah 53 that he was reading about the suffering servant and picturing Yeshua, picturing Jesus Christ. Yeshua is the Hebrew name that he off, it's the only name he would have heard uh, Besides rabbi and master and all that, uh, he was Yeshua. We call it Jesus from the Greek Jesus today. But the Hebrew word his mama called him would have been Yeshua, which means salvation. So anyway, so the eunuch answered Philip. I'm in Acts 8, verses 34 and 35. The eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the, this prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? Verse 35 of Acts 8, 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began, or beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. So just as I said in the beginning, that if I am asked what I believe, I'm going to talk about Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, and God Almighty, the Father of Jesus Christ and my Father. Anyway, then he asked to be baptized, the Ethiopian eunuch did, and stated his belief in Jesus Christ, like it says in Romans 10 that I quoted already earlier. Confess with the mouth, believe in your heart. Jesus is the Son of God and he lives again. So that's what he did here. This eunuch confesses his belief in Jesus Christ and that he is the Son of God and was baptized. So you, do you see where this is going? These, this is the primary thing we need to understand is our primary belief. When Peter was told to go to a household of the Gentile centurion, the Roman officer Cornelius, what was his message? Did he say, well, Cornelius, uh, you have to be sure you're not keeping those pagan Roman Saturnalia festivities that we now call Christmas, or you have to stop eating pork. He, he doesn't say any of that. Now, don't, un under don't misunderstand me. I... I don't keep Christmas. I don't eat pork. Okay, you got that, right? But what's the central message Peter brought? Here he is, Acts 10, verses 34 to 44. Acts 10, verses 34 to 44. And then Peter opened his mouth and said that, in truth I perceive, by the way, I'm going to alternate, roughly alternate, between video sermons, which are a lot more work for everybody, and these audio sermons. So you keep, keep checking both the audio and video sermons. So Acts 10, 34, he says, Of truth I perceive God shows no partiality, because up until that time Peter would have thought that only the Jews were being worked with by God. But now he's working, obviously, with Gentiles. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Bang, he gets right into Jesus Christ. That word you know proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, John the Baptist. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. Here we're back to Jesus again, as it should be. 
and with power, anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. So a lot of illness is an oppression of evil spirits. It doesn't mean they're demon-possessed, but evil spirits like to make us be sick. So anyway, he went everywhere healing, and all who were possessed, the, oppressed, I mean not possessed, oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Verse 39, and we are witnesses of all the things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Verse 40, him God raised up on the third day. Now, it might have well been that uh, Jesus, Yeshua, was he carried uh, a beam, a cross beam with him when he was crucified and may well have been a part of a tree that was there that they uh, nailed the cross beam onto because it does mention a tree here him God raised up on the third day showed him openly not to everyone but to witnesses chosen ahead of time by God even to us who ate and drank with him before he arose or I mean after he arose sorry even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead continuing now in Acts 10 Verse 42, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify about the Sabbath, about this. and No, to testify that it is he, Christ, who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him, come back to I believe in Christ, he's my savior, he's my king. Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. And they did believe God did send his Holy Spirit, and then they were baptized. So God was saying, yes, yes, I completely feel these are people uh, that I want to be part of my children, part of my body. And so uh, that's what we see going on. What did Apostle Paul preach to Gentile Athens? Acts 17, verse 18, he was invited up to the Areopagus, also called Mars Hill. Um, Mars is the Roman name for Ares, the god of war. And this is the, uh, the hill of Ares. That's what Areopagus means. Um, and so Paul went up, and they, um, uh, they wanted to talk to him about this Jesus that he was talking about, this resurrection. And what would have been your central message to people like that? You're now in front of a legislative body, a judicial body, a combination. Let's see what Paul's uh, message was. He actually has some surprising things in the first thing he says to the ruling body in Athens. We've been to Mars Hill, my wife and I, and it's uh, really relatively close to the Acropolis where the, uh, uh, the main tourist site <clears throat> Acts 17, verses 22 to 31. Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. So he starts with a compliment. I guess they took that as a compliment. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, just to make sure we didn't miss anybody out. He's saying, you have an inscription saying, To the unknown God. Now, many of us would have said, first of all, i got to tell you, you've got to get rid of that. That's an idol. Unknown at that. Come on, smash that thing. No, that's not what he said. Notice what he says. It's amazing. Acts 17, verse 23. At the end of it, Therefore the one whom you worship, without knowing that you're worshiping him, or not knowing that who this one is that you worship, him I'll proclaim to you. I just think it's surprising that Paul says you're already worshiping this unknown God that I'm going to tell you about. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, because he gives to all life, breath, and, and all things. And he is made from one blood. We all bleed red, don't we? Whether we're black or brown or, or white or whatever. He's made from one blood, every nation of men, to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. 
so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. He's saying, seek this unknown God, seek him, though he is not far from each of us. That's surprising too, because a lot of times I talk to, what let's just call church members, and uh, sometimes we can be very down on people of the world. He is not far from each of us, and for in him we live, move, and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for he, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, he's basically telling these Greeks, these pagan Greeks, something we many of us would not say. Therefore, since you're children of God, you are children of God. We ought not to think that divine nature is like gold, silver, or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He's given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So again, what's Paul doing? He's speaking primarily of Yeshua, of Jesus Christ, that he is coming to judge the world and that all will be raised from the dead to face him. And remember, he was speaking to Gentiles. He could just as easily have said, you know what? You all need to stop eating eels. You need to get rid of all your idols. Smash them. You got to start st stopping your work and worshiping God and resting on the seventh day, the day of rest. These are so important. Come on, Ath Athenians. Get it right. But no, that's not what he said. Now, the things I just said are important. But even regarding idolatry, he says something so surprising. I'm going to speak about a God you already worship but don't know him and don't know it that you're worshiping him. You call him the unknown God. I just find that so fascinating, the wording that Paul chose there, or was inspired to say. I find it strong and yet gentle and accepting, welcoming at the same time. I doubt I would have said it that way. You already worship him without knowing it. I speak about I speak of your unknown God. Anyway, sometimes we just come off too strong. And I have too in the past. We want everyone to see more of the scriptures. We get impatient when they don't get it right away about Sabbath and other things. We can learn from the examples of Peter and Paul and others. Now, I have a pastor in a third world country who speaks on the radio. After speaking one time, a prison warden who heard the radio broadcast of my friend invited him to come and speak several times in his prison to the 115 inmates. The question the pastor now had for me was, what should I say to them in my very first message? My reply basically is everything I've just said. Tell them that in spite, and give them hope. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about the resurrection. Tell them about the high calling. And give them hope. So I would tell them, is what I said to my pastor in this other country, tell them that in spite of what they've done wrong and how they've messed their lives up, their life is not over. If they call out to the living God and acknowledge the error of their ways and ask for his forgiveness and ask for his strength to get back and stay on that right path, God will be there for them. Tell them that. Tell them to ask their maker to cleanse them of all of their sins. Every one of them, the little ones, the big ones, all of them. Read to them 1 John 1, 7-9 that God erases all of our sins, all of our unrighteousness. Read to them John 3, 15-17, or 16 and 17. And show them they can be seen by God as holy and clean by holy God himself. Tell them they need to decide to turn around, go the other way, start to pray. And just that just means start talking to someone called God. Don't worry if you're doing it right or wrong, just start talking to him. Keep it simple. 
Seek God's word. If you need a Bible, we'll try to get you a Bible. God will offer you a new life, a new start, even eternal life. And read to them John 3, verses 16 and 17. This is the primary thing we believe. That's what I'm trying to say. John 3, 16 and 17. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, even all of you here in this jail, I would be saying to them, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn you all. You believe in him, he does not see you guys as condemned. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. John three seventeen, But that the world through him might be saved. Everybody knows 16, 17 is really inspiring too. I told the pastor I certainly personally would not get into in that first message or second or third message. Things that might intrigue uh, people who've been in the Bible longer. Where are Enoch and Elijah? Does anyone go to heaven? And uh, things like that. What happens when you die? Uh, you can talk about those things later. But, but talk now about the life that God is offering them. Eternal life, a new start, being washed clean. Give them hope. I don't care whatever they've done. And you might even say that to them. I would say to the pastor. Whatever you've done, nothing is beyond being forgiven by God when you repent and come before him. Repent means to turn around, go the other way, change your mind, change your way. Don't keep doing what you've done before. So that's the central message of the good news of the kingdom of God, that the door has been opened into that kingdom for all God's calling. The door is Jesus Christ. Maybe you read them the verse that I am the door. He's also the way, the way, the truth, and life into that kingdom. So those thoughts certainly represent what I mean and say when I ask, what do you believe? That's what I start with now. And let's learn to apply a lot more gentleness as well. Do you remember the story of Naaman, the Syrian leper? If you don't, it's in it's in 2 Kings 5, verses 14 to 19. 2 Kings 5, verses 14 to 19. Naaman was a leper from Syria. He was a general. He was like commander-in-chief of the armies under the king of Syria. He had leprosy. He had been told by a servant girl who had been kidnapped and captured by the Syrians. And this little Israelite girl said, I know a prophet in Israel who heals people. And so he went down to see this Elisha. So he came to Elisha's house, and you can read it, read the story in Second Kings 5. And Elisha didn't even come out and say hello. <laughs> but Elisha just sent a servant out to say, just go dip in the Jordan seven times and you'll be fine. That offended him. He thought there were far better rivers in Syria than the Jordan. And so Naaman went down to the Jordan River finally and dipped himself. Second um, Kings 5.14 And then his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. And he was healed. Beautiful story, isn't it? And then Naaman called and his entire party went back Okay. He went back and to find the man of God. They stood before him, Naaman said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Wow. So please accept my gift. And Elisha said, No thanks. And, um, and then Naaman said, All right, let me take some dirt back and I'll build an altar in Syria to have burnt offerings or sacrifices to no other God except your God, Jehovah, the Lord. Now, many of us might have said, wait a minute, you don't know how to do offerings. You don't know how to do sacrifices. And that's all supposed to happen in Jerusalem anyway. He doesn't say that. But Naaman continues in verse 18, 2 Kings 5, 18. However, may Jehovah pardon me in this one thing, where you have the Lord in your Bible. It's the, what they call the Tetragrammaton, four letters, Y-H-V-H, -H, 
or YHWH, the B's and W's were interchangeable. Some believe it's Yahweh, some believe it's Yehovah. But in my notes, I always put YHVH because it's the Lord. Yes, he is the Lord, but the Lord is not the meaning of YHVH, nor, is it, nor does it sound like it. It's just not the right word. YHVH has more to do with him being eternal and, and living forever, who was and is and is to come and all that. But anyway, verse 18, may Jehovah pardon me in this one thing. When my, now listen carefully. What would you have thought and what would you have done? What would you have said? When my master the king goes into the temple and of the god Rimmon to worship there, it's a pagan god, and leans on my arm because the, the king was a little bit infirm. May Jehovah pardon me when I bow as well. You might think, Elisha would say, you unthankful, ungrateful wretch. Here our God has healed you, and you want me to give you permission to go into that temple with your king. And when he bows to the god Rimmon, you're going to bow as well? What's the matter with you, Naaman? That's not what he said. He said, go in peace. Elisha said, so Naaman started home again. So anyway, um, you see how Elisha wanted to introduce him to the God of Israel, the living God, Jehovah, Yahweh, some of you say. And that's where our starting point really is. I don't think we represent God's high calling correctly and what the chief beliefs of the kingdom of God are. If we start immediately with clean and unclean meats and Christmas and holidays and the holy days and the Sabbath. Sabbath's very important. Sabbath is one of the signs of God's people, but give yourself a little time to get there. The primary thing is accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So whenever I've asked people in the church, I say in the church, those who believe they're believers, keep the Sabbath and all that, to explain their primary beliefs, that's what they invariably do. No pork, no Christmas, no Sunday, and you've got to keep Seventh-day Sabbath. I also recommend we speak of love, God's love. And even more important than speaking of God's love and our love for others is that they see us living a life of love for others. They were doers of the word. Remember, we prove what we believe by what we do. I mean, that's what basically James says, that faith without works is dead. If you claim something to believe, you've got to live it. If I claim I believe people should get enough sleep, but I don't, then I don't really believe it. If you claim to believe that we all should speak kindly and nicely to one another, but F-words come out of your mouth when you're excited or angry, the F-bomb, no, you don't believe it. And if you're a real believer in God, then Christ, Christ will live in me and in you the way he did the first time. Righteously. And you won't be hearing F-bombs from Christ. I'm picking on F-bombs because I'm finding even church people use bathroom language. Say holy this and holy that, and I have a bathroom word. And I've, and I've heard some believers who claim to be believers, on Facebook even, using the F-bomb. They'll say F star star star. Don't! Stop it! If you really believe in Jesus Christ, you're really going to let him live in you. And I will too. You and I will fail and we will fall and we will still sin. Yes, we do. I do. And that's why our righteousness is the righteousness which is of faith. The righteousness by faith in his performance. And he will come and live in us and live righteously in us. But as we stumble, Christ sees his righteousness covering us. I have sermons on the righteousness of God. Just 
look up the word righteousness in the search bar and look for sermons about the righteousness of God that God gives us by faith. And that's the righteousness we begin to live more and more and more. So we say we believe in the Sabbath. They see us, if we're working, coming home before the Sabbath starts. Arriving before the Sabbath starts. They see we aren't getting drunk. We see, they see we aren't gambling. They see we're at peace and have a happy marriage. They don't hear us being nasty to the wife or the husband. So are we applying God's teaching? Those are the ways we really show what we believe. We believe Jesus is the Son of God. Let's show it by the way we live. Do we help those who are sick in practical ways? Remember Matthew 25, when you've done this or that, you've done it unto me. Do you visit those in prison? Do you help the sick? Do you feed the hungry? Do you clothe the poor and, and those who have no clothing? We do try here at Light on the Rock to assist those in poor countries and even here in America who are very poor and need some help. We gladly accept any help from you to help us help them. Thank you. Thank you in advance. So when asked, get down to the true major beliefs first. Don't major in the minors. Don't major in the minors. Major in the majors. The major is God in heaven loves us sent his son to die for us and to be resurrected for us and to live again for us and in us. And he was resurrected. And then you can take it further from there with other opportunities. I hope this gives you some food for thought. Let your central message about what you believe be about the love of our Father and the demonstrated love of our Savior and King and that you submit to him, you've surrendered to him and you feel so bad when you fail as I do and you do we all fail from time to time and we repent forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are debtors who are our debtors who have sinned against us forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us lead us not into sore trial or temptation deliver us from the evil one that's my daily prayer among many other things I pray about I need him. I want him. I love him. And hear them, let them hear you speak of your love for God. I love God. I love Father. I love Jesus. He has not come to condemn me, nor you, but to give us eternal life. That's what I really deeply primarily believe.